The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. Rockler Woodworking and Hardware, create with confidence. And Clearview Cyclones, clear the air and breathe easy. After the recent changes to the Wood Whisperer guild structure, some older videos just didn't fit anymore. So I'm bringing those videos here for your viewing pleasure. Please enjoy. Now on today's show, I'm gonna give you some great tips for creating beautiful cove moldings on your table saw. Now to make a cove molding at the table saw, all you really need to do is run the board across the blade at an angle. Now the first time you hear that, that sounds a little bit crazy because it kind of flies in the face of everything we've learned about table saw safety. But trust me, there is a very safe way to do it and I'm gonna show you exactly how. Now you may be wondering why we are using the table saw to do this instead of some of the other tools that you might think would be more appropriate. So let's say like a shaper or a router or even a planer molder uh, that has a nice big wide profile knife to it. Well, the reason is primarily most of us don't have those things. Even my router table, I've got a good selection of bits, but I don't really have anything that can do this. Smaller maybe, but certainly not this size. And even if I did, I would be limited by the bits that I have in my collection. At the table saw, you can do an incredible uh, array of different shapes, different sizes, and really your imagination is the limit. So uh, I'm gonna show you a couple different methods, some a little bit easier than others, but uh, I think you'll find one that's gonna work for you. And be prepared, because it's gonna make a mess. Now let's break our coves up into two specific groups. The first is symmetrical. Symmetrical basically just means that the center point of that cove is the highest point. It's known as the apex. Now in an asymmetrical cove, that highest point is gonna be off to one side or the other, and it kind of gives it a little bit of a, a bottom heavy or, or possibly a top heavy look. Very cool, but it requires a slightly different setup. Now to make the symmetrical, all we need to do is keep our blade up and straight, and we just vary the angle at which we uh, run the piece across the table saw. But when you're doing an asymmetrical curve, you need to actually bevel the blade to whatever particular degree you need, and that becomes a little bit more complicated. So let's start off by making a few symmetrical coves, and I'll show you that process. Now, what I consider to be the absolute simplest way to make a cove, not necessarily the fastest way, but the simplest way, is really trial and error and lining things up by eye. For instance, if you look straight on and you hold your workpiece in front of the blade, and you vary the angle left to right. Now, first of all, the blade height, that's a constant because we usually know how deep you want that cove to be, uh, but let's consider that one of the variables as well. Maybe we're not sure what we want. Well, you can change the angle, and you can change the blade height up and down, and sight from the side that you're gonna be pushing towards, sight from the other side, and see what that blade looks like if you were to sort of, with your imagination, imagine it just cleaning out all of that material in one fell swoop. Now in order to do a cut like this safely, you obviously need some kind of an auxiliary fence installed so that you could ride the workpiece across it and not have any chance of anything moving out of place and kicking back. Um, so at the very least, you wanna have some sort of a rigid fence. So a piece of plywood works well, it's actually even better if you've got something a little bit wider because there's less of a chance of it deflecting as you push across. Now I take it one step further. I don't like having just one piece. I want a fence on both sides of my work piece, which gives me a lot more security. Now you don't absolutely have to do that unless you're doing a really, really deep cove, but I do recommend it. I feel much more comfortable when I'm doing that uh, and it makes it easier just to guide this work piece through a channel than to have to constantly force it into this fence, which could also lead to eventually deflecting it a little bit. So at the very least though, you wanna take a board and clamp it down to both the front of the bench and the back of the bench. Now incidentally, we have a directional issue here. Should we be feeding from right to left as you see it here? Or should I be going from left to right? Really on a symmetrical cut, it doesn't matter so much either way, but it's good to get into the habit of doing it the way you should uh, just in case you ever wind up doing an asymmetrical cut where we bevel that blade. Now I'll go into more detail about that later, but suffice it to say we should probably just learn the rule now. So that if you have a left tilt saw, you're gonna wanna go from left to right, like this. And if you have a right tilt saw, you wanna go the other way. You wanna go from right to left. Just lock that away in your brain and we'll get back to it in a little bit. 
Now, I was reading an article from uh, Fine Woodworking recently about this exact technique, and the author was using a parallelogram jig, something like what I have here. And they were just using it for setup, but then once they had the angle established, it would go back and he would have some, some sort of a single-sided fence system that he would use. Now, I like a double-sided fence, like I mentioned before, and I figured, you know what, a parallelogram jig like this, why can't that be the fence system if we're using it to set everything up anyway? And that's exactly what I did. I just beefed it up a little bit. I made the, uh, the two sides a little bit wider, a little bit more heavy duty, and I think it's gonna work rather well for this. So I'll give you guys the plans for uh, this very, very simple jig, and you can make your own if you think it's something that's gonna be useful to you. Uh, but let me show you how I use it to set up for a specific sized symmetrical cove. So now here is a drawing, and it's a good idea to draw your coves on the end grain so you know exactly what you're going for. This is gonna be about a half inch deep and three inches wide. I know my cove is three inches wide, so I set the parallelogram jig to three inches and lock it down. Then I set the blade to the maximum height of the cove, a half inch. Now with the saw unplugged, I manually rotate the blade while varying the angle of the jig. You have the perfect angle when both the front and back teeth just kiss the surface of the front and back inside rails. Now I use a pencil to mark the position of the inside rails on the table saw top. As an alternative, you can use a few strips of blue tape, which I find works even better. Now I loosen the jig and use my workpiece itself to give the jig its final setting. Remember, we previously set the jig for the width of the cove, not the width of the workpiece itself. And now it's a simple matter of centering the jig on the lines. And this is why I like to use the blue tape. I usually do this part by eye, and the bright blue color makes it very easy to see. Finally, I clamp the jig into place. And here's a look at the final setup. Now before making my first pass, I put the blade down to about a sixteenth of an inch. With the dust collection on, I begin making my passes. Now I always use push pads for this operation, and I never raise the blade more than an eighth of an inch per pass. Doing so will put a significant amount of strain on your saw, so don't rush it. Notice that I'm bringing the wood back across the blade after each pass. I'm comfortable doing this simply because I have a two-sided fence. If you have a one-sided fence, I definitely would not recommend doing that. Now with the final passes, you can see the cove come to life. And don't worry about that cut halfway up the board, this is just a piece of scrap wood. Alright, so now it's time to try our hand at an asymmetrical cove. And you can see in my example here, the cove's apex is slightly off-centered. Okay, the first line is my center line, and the second line is the peak, the apex of the cove. So the first thing I'm gonna do is tilt my blade to approximately, roughly 45 degrees, and uh, I'll show you the low-tech way first. So the first thing I do is change the bevel angle to roughly, you know, somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees, approximately. And then I bring the blade's height up to the maximum height of my cove, okay? And once that's set, that's unknown. We don't have to really worry about that too much. I have the two variables to play with, and that is the exact bevel angle, as well as the angle of attack that this workpiece is gonna take. And the only way I can really see what's truly going on is to sight at this level from all the way over there. And as soon as I, I have that angle, I can kind of go back and forth with a little bit of trial and error, and eventually get something that's pretty darn close. And then once I'm there, I lock this down, uh, maybe use a pencil again to mark the location, and I bring my parallelogram jig back and clamp it down to the table, and then you're done. All right, so that is the quick and dirty method. Now sometimes the quick and dirty method is gonna work, but other times it's just not gonna be good enough. If you have a very specific cove profile that you need, you can't really use that method. Now fortunately, there are calculators online that will do all of this math for us, because I certainly have no idea how to begin approaching uh, the calculations required to get these numbers. But uh, one in particular that I found online was on Fine Woodworking's website, and it goes with a great article about uh, cove cutting as well. But the calculator itself is, is really simple, and it works really great for this. All you really need to do is plug in two or three numbers that we're gonna know just by drawing this out, 
and it spits back out an exact angle that you need to approach the blade, as well as the bevel angle of the blade. And you can't really ask anything more than that. As soon as you have those numbers, you have everything you need to know to get the exact profile that you've drawn on your workpiece. So that's where it starts. Let's draw this out. I'll show you exactly what numbers you need for the program, and then we'll punch those numbers in and see what we get. Okay, drawing the arc shouldn't be too bad here. We just need to create a center line. The total span of that uh, cove is going to be three inches. So I wanna go an inch and a half this way. Put a mark. Okay, and an inch and a half, and an inch and a half this way. I normally don't use a Sharpie for this. I just wanna make sure you can see it. Now, a half inch from the center line is the apex offset. Okay, that's the top of the cove. That's gonna be about a half inch away. So put a little line and we'll extend it. And the distance from the bottom or the total depth of the cove is three quarters of an inch, right there. So for fun, you can grab a, a French curve, connect this point to these two points, and that represents the cove. Okay, and the numbers that they need here are the apex offset, that's this distance here. For me, that's a half inch. They need the total height or the, what would be the depth of the cove. Okay, that's three quarters of an inch. Let me write that half inch in. Okay, so that's three quarters. And they want the total length from this point to this point, the total span of that cove. And we know that to be three inches. So let's plug those in. Using the program at finewoodworking.com, I simply plug in three quarters of an inch for the cove depth, three inch for the cove length, and a half inch for the apex offset. Then I hit calculate. The program reports back a fence angle of 61 degrees and a blade tilt angle of 38 degrees. Now the bevel's the easy part. The program told us that we need to go to 38 degrees, so that's a simple adjustment on a table saw. Now setting the angle of approach is a little bit trickier. It's 61 degrees is what the program told us that we need. And I've got one of these little angle finder dealy whackers here. I'm gonna set that for 61. And this could be all you need if you happen to have one of these. I just use the front line of the table saw for reference, and it tells me that this is now the angle that I need. So I just butt my workpiece up against there, and that is my 61 degrees. Okay, so at this point, again, using the pencil, I could just draw on the table, I could use blue tape to mark those positions, and then drop my parallel jig right on top. Now another way that you can do this, and this is the method that I'm going to use, involves using your miter gauge and a very simple square. So the program told us 61 degrees. We subtract that from 90, and that gives us 29. Make sure your blade is at the maximum height of the apex here. You want to make sure it's 3 quarters of an inch high. So now I take my square, put it up against the miter gauge and bring it forward. And what I'm looking for now is the point that the blade just contacts that square. And then I just back it off just a hair. Okay, so once you're at that point of contact, then again, drawing on the insert. Okay, so right now I'm drawing a line that basically intersects with the front tip of that tooth, the very front of the blade. So now that line that we just drew represents the very front tip of the blade, which means it's the very front tip of our cove. So what is the offset that we need? Because if we put our jig there, that's not really gonna work. We need to make sure that the blade sits inside of this workpiece. So my offset is a half inch on both sides. So I'm gonna go back to the, uh, to the line there and draw a parallel line a half inch back toward me.
Now you may be wondering why we're not measuring the same way at the back of the blade and then measuring off three quarters of an inch and drawing another parallel line. Well, because of the parallelogram jig, we don't really need to. If we get the jig set to the perfect width, which we just basically use our workpiece to do that, lock it down, all we really need to do is set the jig up, line it up, the inside face gets lined up with our outermost line that we drew. And because we know the jig is parallel, we know that the back piece is exactly where it needs to be. We don't have to measure. We just line it up by eye and clamp it down. Now we just lower the blade and let the fun begin. As you can see, what we're left with is just a gorgeous cove. And those offset coves, whew, very nice. So making the cove, that's the fun part. Cleaning it up, that's the not so fun part. So I'm just gonna put my uh, cove out of this cherry board into the bench and show you a couple of the ways that I like to, uh, to clean it up. Now you can use sandpaper or you can use some sort of a scraper. I have two scrapers that I like to use for this. One is a, basically a straight scraper with one a concave and one convex side. That works really well. And then of course a gooseneck scraper. So either one of these, it's really the same principle. The fact that it's got a nice curved edge on it allows us to get all of those extra ridge marks out of there. Let's try this guy. Now after the scraping, I probably would go and do a light sanding just to make sure everything is nice and smooth. So here's a few possible ways that you could go about the sanding. Uh, first of all, I've got one of these rubber oscillating spindle uh, sander spindle dealies. And if you can keep the sleeve on there, you can actually just use that by itself. And you can go all the way from the uh, rough sanding to the super fine sanding using this. And if you run out of sleeves, just use regular sandpaper and wrap it around. Now here's another option, and this one's kind of neat. It's a little sanding apparatus that has these little plastic inserts in here that are spring-loaded, so you can actually push them into the surface and they'll mold to that surface. And you have these little uh, Velcro sandpaper sheets that go onto it like so. And you sand away. Now you'll probably have to change the profile of this thing um, every once in a while, depending on the type of curve that you have, because it's only going to take on, you know, what this inch and a half uh, portion of your cove. Now the final option, which is actually the cheapest, is just using a dowel rod with some sandpaper wrapped around it. This is just something from one of our closets in the house that I had cut down and would be perfect for a project like this. Just wrap some sandpaper, uh, maybe um, tape it on the back end or something so it doesn't slip off and back and forth. Obviously you'd want to cut it down from this big long one, um, but that'll do the trick too. So once you get the technique down, the possibilities are endless. There are just so many different shapes and different sizes that you can make with this, and you're just limited by your own creativity. So hopefully you'll give this technique a shot. Let me know how it works out for you. Thanks for watching. Now the design for this jig was inspired by a very similar jig that I saw in a fine woodworking article. In that article, they used the jig for setup purposes and then went to some other type of fence system. And I figured, well, why not just make it a little bit sturdier and have that be my fence? And then I get the uh, added benefit of having a fence on both sides. So that's basically the idea behind this. Now, in using it for the video, I've realized a couple areas where I might be able to improve things and stuff I wanna bring your attention to before you build yours. First of all, the length of the rails. Depending on the angle here, it may be kind of tricky to clamp this down to the table saw. So you may want to make these a little bit longer, have maybe a four to six inch extension on each one of these, just with the bottom piece so that you can clamp it down more securely. You may even want to go further out with the whole thing, just make it really long. 
Uh, but I did find that this particular one was certainly adequate, but required a little creative clamping at times. Now the second thing, if you have a thin piece of material, uh, no problem. You could fit that right under this little bridge here and you have no issues there. But let's say you have a big fat piece of uh, eight quarter material, that's not gonna fit there. Now, if you could fit it in between the blade and the bridge here, you're fine. You could run it back and forth with no problem. But a lot of cases, you're gonna have a longer piece than this. You need to be able to feed it from behind. So in order to accommodate that in the second build of this, I think what I'm gonna do is create some extra inserts that you could just pop down on here. And as long as your bolt is long enough to go through there, it'll keep raising the bridge up higher and higher depending on the uh, thickness of the molding that you wanna make. So let's go ahead with the redesign and I'll show you uh, as we go some of the improvements and the entire process from start to finish. I'm disassembling the old jig just to give you a general idea of how it was constructed. Removing the knobs allows me to remove the connecting rails. Notice it's a pretty tight fit. The bolts are easily removed and notice that on the bottom of the jig I created a recess so that the head of the bolt sits below the bottom surface of the jig. If you don't do this, the bolt will scratch your table saw top. So now let's build a new version of the jig. I start by making two 4 inch wide rails from some Baltic birch. Consider ripping a third piece for other parts of the jig. With the two pieces ganged together, I trim one end flush and then carefully flip the pieces around and trim them to final length, 54 inches. Keep in mind that your cutoffs from this step could also be used later on in the process. My cutoffs weren't long enough, so I needed to rip a third piece of Baltic birch for this step. I'm cutting the small 4 inch by 2 inch pieces that go under the connecting rails. To make quick work of it, I use a pencil line on the saw surface as a guide. If you're careful to put the workpiece up to the line the same way every single time, this is remarkably accurate. I cut eight pieces this way. Now we need to drill the bolt holes in the dead center of the small blocks. I simply draw a couple lines corner to corner to find the exact center. At the drill press, I set up my fence and stop block so that I can make a repeatable hole. I drill all eight pieces this way. Now we need to make the two connecting rails. Mine are 13 inches long and one and a half inches wide. Using the adjustable square, I mark a line one inch in from each edge. And then I mark the center point of that line, which is approximately three quarters of an inch. Using the drill press and a stop block again, I set up for repeatable drilling. Each end of both connecting rails is drilled this way. Now I need to mark the locations of the support blocks. I mark a line in two inches from the edge of one of the long rails. Using my line for reference, I use glue and a couple of brad nails to secure the support block. Now instead of measuring on the other side and drawing a line, I want a more accurate way of ensuring exact spacing on both of my rails. So I use a scrap piece of ply cut to 46 inches as a guide. I rest the other support block right against the guide and secure it with glue and brads. Repeat the process for the second rail. Now I need to use the holes in the support blocks as guides for drilling all the way through the rails. And then I use a Forstner bit to create the recesses for the bolt heads. And now with the bolts inserted, we can assemble the jig. So after just an hour's worth of work, you got a pretty functional parallelogram jig. Now you can pretty it up a little bit, sand it, maybe put a coat of wax, a coat of poly on it, round over some of these sharp edges just to make it a little more user friendly. But for the most part, this is all you need to do. You got plenty of room here for nice wide pieces. Just lock it in place, tighten these down and you're good to go. Now the other thing that we discussed in the beginning was possibly modifying some of the original plans and uh, making it easier to clamp and also uh, allowing us to put taller pieces under here. So I did do those improvements. On the outside, I've got an extra two inch lip on each side that should help facilitate better clamping on a table saw. And 
on the ends here, I had, uh, had to cut four extra pieces that are gonna work like shims, basically. You just drop those on top, and then now that effectively raises the height of our little bridge here, and you can very easily now fit eight quarter stock right underneath there. So I guess if you really wanted to, you could just glue these secondary blocks down and put the bridge on top of that, because really there's no harm in it being taller. Uh, it's just an issue if it's not tall enough. Uh, but for most of the work I do, it's a little bit more lower profile stuff, so the jig doesn't quite jut out as much. Maybe that's one reason not to do it, but you know, it's your jig, do whatever you like. Uh, but either way, for an hour's worth of work, it's a pretty good time investment and not a whole lot of material goes into it. So if you haven't already seen the cove molding video, go back and watch that because I show exactly how you can incorporate this into your workflow. So I hope you have fun building yours and uh, please email me and let me know any modifications and changes that you've done to yours. I'd love to see it and we could even uh, post the pictures on the website. So thanks for watching and uh, have fun building your jigs.